Good afternoon. Welcome to the end of a very long week here at Cornell. Great to see you guys here. Thank you for making it. My name again is Linda Shaw, and I'm assistant professor here at Cornell's Department of City and Regional Planning. It's my delight to welcome you to this, this week's installment of our research seminar series featuring researchers in the areas of planning and beyond that relate to the study of cities. So today I'm really delighted to have Ashton who I demand acknowledgement. Uh, today we have Dr. Akira Gray for previous here with us. Um, and before we turn to her presentation, let me invite Mariam and Hyde to the end of the house. Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Diaphano, the Cayuga Nation. The Diaphano are members of the Mahabunasoni, Integrity, and a land of six sovereign nations with an historic and contemporary presence on their side. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of the Gaiagolo dispossession and on, uh, honor the ongoing connection of Gaiagolo people, past and present, to these lands and others. Thank you so much. So this week we have uh, Dr. Akira Gray Rodriguez, who is an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania's Weizmann School of Design. Her research examines the ways that disenfranchised groups reappropriate the marginalized spaces in the city to gain access to and sustain their urban political power. She is the author of Divergent States, Resilience, and Politics of Atlanta's Public Housing, which is the topic of her lecture today, which explores how the politics of public housing planning and based in Atlanta created a politics of resistance within its public housing development. Dr. Rodriguez was recently awarded a Spencer Foundation grant to study how educational advocates mobilize around school facility planning processes. She's also incredibly active in, um, in local and local politics and advocacy in Philadelphia, and she, as well as on the community deal for schools nationally. Professor Rodriguez was born in Alexandria, Virginia, a brief week in Pennsylvania, and Philadelphia, and then spent her formative years in Louisville, Kentucky. She has a BS in economics from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania and an MBA from the Elk Institute at the University of Pennsylvania. She received her PhD from the Edward Blaustein School of Program Planning and Public Policy at Rutgers, where she was a friend and colleague of our Professor Nick Klein. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm just gonna hop right into it. Um, from what I understand, a uh, little bit of this presentation should be about sort of like opening the black box of methods and thinking about like the process in which this project was born. So um, as noted, this is my recent book, Diverging Space for Deviance, The Politics of Atlanta's Public Housing. Um, this is a work that came out of my dissertation. Um, from Rutgers in 2014. Um, and so there was a nice like seven year period between the dissertation and the book. And so I'm, I'm happy to talk about that process as well. Um, but first, just to give you a little background, um, this project started as a, an investigation into sort of the politics of mixed income housing is how I kind of first entered into understanding public housing very broadly. Um, all of the literature I saw on affordable housing and mixed income development uh, cast public housing as a problem. Um, and my understanding of public housing, particularly what I learned in history and theory was that public housing was seen as some solution at one point that it was actually um, a, a solution to the issue of slums and disorganization and public health crises and employment crises in the wake of the Great Depression and later on in urban renewal um, and specifically the housing crises. And so to see it being recast as a problem uh, was an interesting problem for me. Um, and so I kind of came across this article in the New York Times in 2011 talking about the demolition of one of the last public housing developments in the city of Atlanta 
And the article mentioned that uh, Atlanta was also the site of the first public housing, uh, Techwood Homes in 1936. And so that was an interesting case of having the first and kind of the first constructed and the first full demolition of a city's public housing stock. And so I sort of began this project um, around that time. Uh, one of the things that um, I was interested in study, I was on my committee, my PhD was in planning, but my committee had no planners on it. It was um, two geographers, a political scientist and a sociologist. Um, and so the ways that I thought about um, public housing and the politics of it was very much structured around political opportunity and um, kind of spatial politics and this concept of diverging or reappropriating space. Um, so the term deviant is um, part of a framework um, from uh, Schneider and Ingram um, and their work on social policy and kind of this like social construction of targets of policy and how some targets are socially constructed as positive, such as the elderly and children and how we typically don't mind giving public services and public goods to them. Um, and some uh, targets are constructed as deviants, such as um, substance abusers, uh, the poor writ large, and uh, usually like single women headed households. And so I'll talk a little bit about that, but that's sort of the, the framework from which I'm, I'm operating. Um, so thinking about um, Atlanta has really sort of touched um, by your land acknowledgement. Um, that's something that we're doing at Penn, um, but really sort of impressive the um, context in which you're developing that land acknowledgement and you're inscribing some very sort of critical history and new timelines that I think are really important. Um, so I did wanna start there. Um, the book really talks about the land before Atlanta um, and how it sort of sat um, in the Confederacy, how it uh, was uh, Cherokee and Creek Muscogee land prior to being um, sort of this very critical terminal of several railroads and becoming very much an industrial and service oriented uh, town um, from its founding. Um, of course, being in the South, it had a very high black population um, following the end of slavery um, and reconstruction produced early political representation from African Americans um, who held seats on city council as early as the 1870s in the city. Um, but one of the first sort of top down implementations to sort of deal with uh, race um, comes in several forms. Um, so here we see a racial zoning map. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with racial zoning and its origins in Baltimore in 1910 um, and its eventual um, abolition uh, that came with Buchanan v. Worley in 1917 in the city of Louisville. Um, but there is also another major court case, uh, Cary v. Atlanta a court case of 1915 that brings into account this issue of racial zoning and understanding how you could not essentially um, segregate or discriminate based on race um, and land use. Um, however, this was mainly the idea that land use of non-white would be valued less or segregated um, or put under different regulation than land use for those who are white. But if you put the same regulations on them, then it kind of worked out. And this is what Atlanta did in 1922 under the guidance of Robert Witten was create a tentative zoning plan, one of the first in the city, again in 1922, that created these ordering schemes, this highest and best use of a zoning code um, that obviously looks at the use and looks at the area um, you see here use districts and area districts and height districts, but also this notation of a race district, um, R2, R3, R1. And so already you see the sort of hierarchy of space emerging um, through these, um, these zoning maps and this sort of continues in Atlanta and particularly over time. Um, as noted, it was in the Confederacies in the South um, and had this very large black population. And so there are other ways um, politically, economically, socially, and spatially in which um, Black residents are sort of construed and constructed as deviant um, as a result of their sort of marginalized position within the city. Another really key component 
of Atlanta's early racial geography was the 1906, which was known as a race riot in the month of September, uh, four days of violence, um, largely targeting black areas of prosperity um, and black residences. And so hundreds of businesses, homes were destroyed. Um, at least 30 people were murdered over these four days um, and really produced the clearing of um, black bodies and households and businesses from the central business district of Atlanta. Um, and relegating them to these sort of five neighborhoods that were soon overcrowded and facing um, an immediate housing crisis. But the issue of racial zoning that sort of overlaid that racial segregation meant that there was no growth possible in um, a non-white uh, um, area and no possible mingling or rezoning um, or spot zoning that was happening at the time. Uh, other issues as a result um, is the inability for Black people to actually make communities. And so uh, one major issue uh, comes with the allocation of public goods and services, particularly libraries and schools. Um, as early as 1902, Andrew Carnegie donates um, a couple million dollars to the city of Atlanta to construct libraries for uh, white and Black residents and sort of segregated neighborhoods and areas. However, because of the constraints around Black land and the prioritization of residential Black land, there are no sites large enough to um, adequately um, create a Black library until the 1920s. Uh, there's similarly the inability to both find and um, assemble land for large-scale housing development and for school development means that early Black schools are overcrowded um, and eventually have Closed because of the high cost of maintaining them. So the New Deal and the Great Depression actually bring about an opportunity for Black residents to become part of the planning process um, in the city of Atlanta. And so through the um, WPA and the Housing Division, the precursor to the 1937 Housing Act and the kind of public housing program as we know it today, um, brings about a lot of tools and regulations um, that are both empowering for um, local Black residents in particular um, and stimulate new uh, growth in the Black economy as it relates to um, construction, labor, um, and eventually this concept of public housing management but also addressing some immediate housing crises and bringing about uh, large scale clearance to create these black neighborhoods that were um, heretofore kind of inaccessible to the black community at the time. Um, so there are these immediate sort of trade-offs and political opportunity um, that emerge um, as a result of the limited power. So in addition to uh, black residents being sort of segregated and marginalized. Here we see this um, land use map uh, from the WPA in 1934 that is mapping these dots represent substandard housing units. Um, these sort of lined areas are the Negro sections or black sections of Atlanta as noted. They've kind of clustered in four or five neighborhoods surrounding the central business district and then parks and playgrounds. You'll notice that all parks but one and a half um, are outside of the black areas and that there are um, substantial substandard um, clustering of homes in black areas at the time. And so these public housing developments would provide um, new standardized modernized units for a pretty disenfranchised community. So in addition to these issues and the sort of marginalization, you also have um, a political tool known as the white primary. Um, this was established in 1892. I mentioned that there was early um, electoral success of um, black representatives on Atlanta's um, early aldermanic board, um, a precursor to its city council. Um, and that immediately shifted with the rise of populism and the 1892 democratic primary um, that was segregated by race. So at the time, political parties were privatized and thus allowed to discriminate without violating um, the 14th Amendment. And so you see this white primary that exists from 1892 to 1946 that effectively renders this Black electorate um, politically uh, weak and 
demobilized and disenfranchised. And so the housing authority and the federal government and this new sort of tool of public housing create um, the ability to actually generate some political opportunity for Black Atlantans um, at the time, at the time of the Great Depression um, and the New Deal. And so you have um, early sort of opposition, of course, to public housing, nothing terribly different to what we see around current public housing and current affordable housing. Um, the idea that this is something that um, people do not want to rely on sort of public um, burdens and the need that um, there should not be such luxurious housing <laughs> for um, those who live in slums, when in reality, uh, most people who are cleared um, to construct public housing uh, were usually not eligible due to the very strict application standards that were applied at the time that included minimum incomes, working adults and employment verifications, and home visits at the time to ensure that the family was intact. Here we see um, some of the archival uh, methods that he used at the time uh, to sort of understand some of the other differences between black and white public housing in Atlanta. I was really interested in understanding, um, obviously we have public housing here acting in kind of this cream skimming way um, by those sort of strict application standards and not really housing those in greatest need, um, but really sort of housing what they were calling the submerged middle class. And so on the left, we have um, a pamphlet for the John Hope Homes, which is a um, all black, um, housing development constructed by the Housing Authority in 1940. And on the right, that for Clark Howe Homes, uh, which was also constructed in 1940 for white families. And so there are some slight differences in the drawings and the renderings of these homes, um, obviously a bit more tasteful and more amenities, it feels like. Um, in the white development versus the black development and also the plate areas. Um, it looks a bit more idyllic, um, more landscaped, uh, more spacious, less dense and crowded um, versus that of the black plate area. But that is pretty much where it, um, these sort of similarities are, um, these differences sort of in um, outside of the actual maximum income limits for admission between black and white residents. Uh, one thing that was really critical are these local advisory committees that are guiding these processes of selecting um, contractors and laborers, architects, engineers, housing managers. Um, all of this was done under these local advisory committees. Um, and that also included the ability to set rents um, that actually reflected the local economy and the local dynamics. And so um, while this is sort of acknowledging that even a two income household as most uh, black households were at the time was able to earn less than one white working male head of household that you would normally find in white public housing, um, even these income limits were much too high to actually house those in greatest need. Um, so many of the early political opportunities or political benefits for public housing in Atlanta did unfortunately only accrue to the upper um, and middle classes of the city. Um, here we see an uh, aerial view of John Hope Homes. Um, I chose um, to look at three separate public housing developments um, over the course of the sort of 75 year history of Atlanta's public housing from about 1936 to 2010. Um, I chose them sort of based on where they were located when they were constructed in public housing history to sort of understand the different political opportunities that emerged over space and time within the city. Um, in the 1980s, um, about 10% of Atlanta's population lived in public housing. And so it actually served as a really sort of vital um, source for um, a significant portion of the city. Um, and it was interesting to think about how this sort of um, political opportunity and this sort of political power and legitimacy 
of um, the unit of public housing development, which is tenant associations, changed over time. Um, so John Hope Homes was adjacent to one of my case studies, University Homes, uh, which was named so because it was near the, um, what is known as the Atlanta University Consortium, um, which is a clustering <clears throat> of HBCUs or historically black colleges and universities in Atlanta. So uh, Morehouse College, um, which became Morehouse University, Spelman College, and um, Atlanta University were the founding kind of universities at the time that provided direct services to uh, the public housing developments that were adjacent to it. Uh, they also provided a lot of the staffing, training, and political education of both the workers and the residents at the time. Um, so everything from sort of creating political education and, you know, basic domestic care um, and domestic work and training services and classes for residents, um, but also um, the Atlanta School of Social Work created one of the first housing manager programs that trained Black housing managers for um, all public housing across the country. And so also acting a little bit as a laboratory in that way. Um, on the right, a photo of the first housing uh, management staff at um, the first public housing development for Black residents in Atlanta, which was University Homes. Um, so this is a photo of the housing manager, Alonzo Marone in the center, um, corresponded like weekly with, um, you know, sort of his superiors in Washington, D.C. and the um, um, Department of Interior, um, who sort of helped to build this early program, but also working and corresponding with um, housing managers in Cleveland and Los Angeles, Texas, all of these really sort of early uh, foundations and lessons are spread through these sort of letter writing campaigns and also some local conferences. Um, of housing managers. I also sort of looked at how um, the planning of public housing sort of fit into the broader planning history um, and looking at the, um, the discourse in particular of what public housing was to bring to the city. So lots of discussion about modernization, of improvement, um, the health benefits of slum clearance, the uh, how this fits into the city beautiful um, schema and timeline around um, sort of the clearance of large um, swaths of sort of disorganized slums um, and the construction of these sort of very manicured and landscaped um, civic spaces. And so thinking about the role of public housing in particular of drawing in early residents um, and drawing in kind of the surrounding neighborhood. So again, in a place like Atlanta, where you see these high rates of segregation in the black community, you're also seeing this lack of public investment and public housing really contributing to the development of political opportunity and also of um, political identity, um, able to sort of jump the scales, um, the sort of local racism um, of the local and state restrictions around voting for Black residents are all sort of um, overcome with the ability to have this sort of direct correspondence with federal agencies that were providing housing, providing recreation, providing um, funds and land to create a lot of the public infrastructure such as schools and libraries that were um, not possible under the local state. Um, in 1940, when control from um, public housing was going from the federal level to the local level, there was some great concern um, around this issue, um, around this transition, that there would be increased issues of prejudice and discrimination of um, having housing transferred back to the local state. And so even this awareness of the global opportunity that was granted and afforded to these residents um, living in the few uh, Black public housing developments in the city, um, you start to see a lot of early mobilization coming out of tenant associations and out of these public housing developments um, that were afforded just a little bit of extra attention um, within the entire city's landscape. I just wanted to note again, the sort of um, 
white primary and its sort of longevity within the city of Atlanta. And so it was not until 1946 that the white primary is deemed unconstitutional in the city of Atlanta and the state of Georgia. Um, and you start to see these sort of open elections happening again, uh, where there is no uh, segregation of primary results. And so um, as early as uh, 1948, um, you, you see uh, the changes in the local political opportunity, particularly with Mayor Hartsfield, um, who would go on to sort of hire um, the first black police officers um, that came um, in the South uh, in 1948. This happened just before a local election in 1949 um, as a way, again, of sort of um, appeasing to the early demands of the black electorate at the time. Um, Hartsfield, um, in this sort of very sort of token um, appreciation or nod to the black community, um, the hiring of the, the black police officers sort of encapsulates some of these negotiations that were made with the white power structure at the time. Um, these eight men were allowed to sort of follow the mayor around at the time. Um, and uh, they walked in parades and had a lot of um, great civic events and appearances, um, but they were segregated, uh, not in the main police precinct, but were instead um, forced to um, have their headquarters at the all black YMCA on Butler Street. Um, they also were not allowed to arrest white people. Um, and kind of continued as just sort of a role of surveillance in the black community without any sort of um, guarantee of public safety. Other political opportunities, again, that came from public housing usually came from within the spaces of public housing. So the opening of health clinics, um, nutrition classes, and other sorts of um, very top down um, and what we sort of think of today as paternalistic policies. Um, Don Parson writes about this in Los Angeles uh, with white and Mexican um, Americans as being subject to these classes and Americanization and sort of making better citizens. And so this also takes shape um, within the sort of all black public housing developments as a way of reinforcing this notion of what Karen Ferguson calls uplift politics. Other political opportunities um, also come in the form of the transition out of public housing and into private home ownership. And so um, just as I sort of mentioned earlier about lots of African-Americans um, not being eligible for public housing, um, the turnover in public housing is actually um, fairly high in the beginning, between 25 and 30 percent over the first 10 years. You see um, lots of uh, residents leaving voluntarily to purchase private housing. And on the right, you see the manager of University Homes, J.R. Henderson, um, sort of pointing out some of these um, success stories, as it were, of uh, families leaving public housing for um, single family private home ownership. Um, the upper left corner is a, a picture of what is known as the Black Kitchen Cabinet, um, sort of FDR's advisory uh, for the New Deal for all of these sort of programs to benefit African Americans. Um, and so while the New Deal is certainly um, noted for its discrimination um, in social security and unemployment for domestic and agricultural workers. Uh, there were other benefits afforded to African Americans that were designed um, particularly by the Black Kitchen Cabinet. Other issues that sort of um, constrain Black residential mobility over time are these sort of changes in public housing policy, but also in private housing policy. And so as um, these more economically mobile families start to leave public housing, you start to get more um, applicants as well as changes in policy around public housing construction around urban renewal, which prioritizes the housing of those who live in this um, in, in the in the homes that were cleared out um, to construct urban renewal projects. Um, and so as a result, you see a less economically mobile population coming in to public housing, 
and these sort of problems that emerge of the concentrations of poverty or the realities of poverty um, that they would not be able to leave public housing as quickly and thus would um, start to um, have reduced rent uh, with increased operating and capital expenditures for public housing. Um, the rise and use of restrictive covenants and other sort of old fashioned um, blockbusting and, and racial violence as sort of dissuading the mobility as well of um, public housing residents into private housing. After the end of the white primary in 1946, um, you start to see a shift um, in the actual geography of Atlanta um, goes from um, 1951, you have the introduction of the plan of improvement, which expanded uh, Atlanta by 74 square miles and added an additional 100,000 residents, um, largely from the northern suburbs, um, predominantly white. This takes um, the black electorate from about 41% of the population to about 33% of the population. Um, so it sort of effectively dilutes um, and um, assuages a lot of the fears that the white power structure had around um, ending the white primary, which is dealing with the sort of um, increasing black population and their ability to, um, in their words, take over local government. And so you see um, with the increase in land, in Atlanta, as well as the um, increase in white population diluting of black roots, um, you start to see this change in the racial geography of the city. And so um, two maps, uh, the 1940 and 1950 census um, with the darker areas representing census tracts that have greater proportions of the black population. And then 1960, after the passage of the plan of improvement, in 1970, um, we see not only the impacts of what the plan does, um, but also the sort of concomitant use of federal funding, um, whether it's in public housing construction, um, and later you'll see like WITEC and Project Base Section 8, this sort of um, ghettoization of federal funding and housing subsidies, in particular going into the Northwest quadrant of the city, which was largely underdeveloped. Um, this was also the cheapest land. And so you start to see a lot of private home ownership opportunities for black residents also emerging in this Northwest quadrant that was um, unfortunately undeveloped on the public sector side. So lacking um, sidewalks, street lights, uh, paved roads, um, regular trash pickups, and of course, schools, libraries, and public transit with this sort of um, rising sort of ghettoization and happening in the Northwest Quadrant, you start to see a more radical bottom up tenant association that went from cooperating with the management and, and taking part in those political education and domestic classes to one that was much more confrontational. Um, here on the left, the rent strike at Capitol Homes in the 1970s and on the right, um, a protest in front of the housing authority uh, relating to pests, rats, mice, um, and other issues around cleanliness. Normally, these would have been attributed to the residents themselves. However, um, with the help of both internal and external supports um, in public housing, whether it's legal aid, um, this protest was actually led by an outside tenant association known as Tenants United for Fairness, TUF. Um, you see increasing, um, increasingly confrontational and women-led um, movement around um, providing better services and goods in public housing developments. And these again spilled out into the community, much like the early political opportunities of you know, better uh, public goods and services and uh, recreation centers and auditoriums from the 1930s and 1940s were able to draw in residents from um, the surrounding public housing community. You now see some of these more sort of radical and direct confrontations around um, housing conditions and sort of the quality of care um, by the city and state uh, spilling out side of public housing developments as well. 
um, we also see um, an, an ability to sort of once again remake space uh, for deviant needs. Um, here we have the little green spur line um, again serving that northwest quadrant that was predominantly black in the city. Um, up until the 1970s, you see uh, most of the workers, um, particularly women workers, serving as domestics in um, the northern suburbs. And so they would come from the northwest, taking several buses down to this um, terminal at the Blue Line, taking that east into the center city, into five points, and then sort of coming up north to work in the homes um, and businesses of Buckhead. And so um, they were pretty desperate to get some subway um, service going all the way through the Northwest. Um, here we see Mary Sanford, who was president of Perry Homes Tenant Association in the Northwest for about um, 30 years, testifying at a MARTA meeting, trying to get that line to go up to Perry Homes. Um, while they were pseudo successful, it obviously did not go um, all the way up the way they wanted to. On the right, Ephemy Matthews, who was part of um, Emma's House, which was a Catholic led um, protest and social justice organization, um, sort of again, sort of making these larger claims on the state and talking about issues of hunger and poverty as they relate to public housing residents as being sort of a critical need of, of local and state policy. Um, a lot of these uh, major sort of complaints or grievances eventually worked their way into federal policy as well, um, where they were able to um, have these sort of very sort of organized tenant movements beginning out of tenant associations and filtering up to national organizations um, in the 1970s to change uh, grievance and eviction procedures, um, again, sort of um, readjusting the power dynamics within public housing development so that residents were more in charge of policy than, than housing managers and executive directors. Um, this was fairly short-lived. Um, as, as early as the 1970s, you start to see um, the housing authority prioritizing the need to evict um, undesirable populations. Um, and this included um, what they call these sort of political rabble rousers. And so you start to see eviction policy becoming um, less about rent and um, financial ability to pay and much more about behavioral issues and violations of leases that were structured around um, behavior. So whether it was having too many children or taking um, advantage of the grievance system or filing too many maintenance complaints or other nuisances, uh, you start to see this change and this increase in surveillance and public housing policy um, in response to these, um, these sort of more um, restrictions around federal funds in particular. Um, thinking about uh, issues within public housing, they still relate largely to infrastructure. Um, here, Mary Sanford, again, uh, president of Perry Homes Tenant Association, talking in 1969 um, that in a um, development of a thousand units, Perry Homes, there were 5,000 residents. Um, and according to her, at least 3,600 children between 16 and 18 years old. Um, and so there, the idea that parks were too far away and the existing park was too small, um, that there is actually no land available again. So starting to see a lot of the same problems emerging as a result of the segregational practices and plans um, of both the city and the housing authority. Um, we start also to see as the sort of um, infrastructure and facilities begin to decline, as well as increased disinvestment, um, whether it be from white flight or the underdevelopment of the Northwest quadrant of Atlanta, um, you start to see residents um, starting to diverge or reappropriate their land to meet um, some of their more urgent needs. And um, so the 
program known as Granny's House, um, dealing with issues around substance abuse um, in single parent homes and the role of child protective services. Um, essentially, you see elderly women or even um, middle aged women sort of taking over vacant units in public housing and using it as temporary foster care so that uh, women who were seeking treatment or um, therapy for um, issues with um, illicit substance use were um, not going to risk having their children taken away from them because they were leaving them alone. And so building in a lot of the informal caretaking and some more formalized programs. Um, you also see the reappropriation of vacant land and vacant homes in the surrounding neighborhoods to serve as uh, food distribution centers or other sort of um, drug rehabilitation centers. Um, here, Susie Labore, another sort of longtime leader of Grady Homes, um, served to advocate a lot for elderly and children in public housing. Um, Susie Labore also kind of marks this transitional point where you have um, this growing um, conservative streak emerging out of tenant association politics. So while they are still um, confrontational with management, they start to collude with them. Um, in an in a attempt largely to take over um, through, um, in the 1990s, you have pilots around residential management corporations where tenants get to take over managerial duties, um, but most contracts between housing authorities and residential management corporations are, are RMCs um, are so narrow that tenants are largely tasked with evicting and surveilling um, tenants. Um, as opposed to actually doing anything transformational that would address some of the maintenance and capital issues of public housing, but instead kind of helping to maintain a, a lighter bottom line for housing authorities. Um, other issues that emerged um, is the sort of myth of the Black Mecca um, in Atlanta, They've had uh, Black leadership, a Black mayor since 1974, and a majority Black council since 1982. Um, and so these issues of respectability um, really start to um, come to a head when you have that increasing proportion of the population living in public housing. Um, as I noted, um, in 1980s, about 10% of the total population was living in public housing, but about 25% of the Black population was living in public housing. And so this became an increasingly, um, an increasing tension between the sort of image of Atlanta as a Black Mecca and this very sort of visible Black poverty. Um, in 1980s, also the, the role of um, the Atlanta child murders were about 30 um, children between the ages of 10 and 22 disappear and are later found um, dead in Atlanta uh, with nearly one third of these victims found um, in or around public housing developments. And so issues of abandonment um, and issues of the sort of like welfare queen narrative sort of collide in Atlanta and also kind of help to repel the idea that uh, public housing developments are increasingly a problem. And around this time, we also see the city um, embarking on these sort of economic impact studies and looking at the role of public housing and the land under public housing as being um, ripe for redevelopment. And so looking at um, these sort of in-town public housing developments as being sort of potential spaces to expand either the convention center or the highways or subway stations, a way of sort of facilitating um, economic opportunity, um, particularly for the central business district and becoming again, very reminiscent of the themes um, and the maps even that were shown in the 1930s um, when justifying the New Deal and slum clearance more sort of economic opportunity, um, the return of policing um, into public housing developments. Um, while early advocates for Black police and um, non-local control 
were very much uh, themes in the 1930s. You again see this rise um, in requests for policing and, and control um, in response to some of the increased crime um, that was experienced in the 1980s and 1990s because of that lack of economic opportunity in the city. Um, eventually, um, deals are made to create many precincts in housing authority, I mean, in public housing developments and the use of vacant units for um, police officers to reside or to um, just sort of take breaks in. So you start to see the, the increase of surveillance there. Here also Mary Sanford talking about some of the ways in which they're able to do this sort of planning um, every day by sort of consistently talking and engaging with residents, um, but also still maintaining um, some level of authority and acting as a middle person between residents and um, the executive director and, and those in power in the city. Um, but over time, the sort of sprawling needs um, particularly uh, economic and social needs of residents um, are, are far beyond the reach of the tenant association. And you start to see their decline and relevance um, emerging as a result. In the 90s um, and, and largely kind of like over time, lots of authors have talked about this idea of demolition as progress um, from Getz to Vale, uh, my colleague Francesca Ammon and even uh, Berman just sort of thinking about um, how constant sort of construction and space making are um, part of the urbanization process. Um, and so eventually the idea of demolition as a solution um, arrives in the city of Atlanta um, through um, the sort of consent and agreement of tenant associations who were aging rapidly, rapidly and becoming um, increasingly um, frustrated through the sort of inadequacy of the space of public housing and the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, and so these sort of tensions um, that are sort of deemed as sort of unproductive or um, unvaluable space, um, reappear in the, the language of public housing developments and in the applications in particular um, for increased federal funding, which was soon available through um, the HOPE 6 program. Um, towards the end of public housing and its demolition, um, you start to see a transformation in the Black leadership in Atlanta um, as being increasingly run by women. And so the chief of police, um, Beverly Harvard, um, the um, first Black woman mayor, um, Shirley Franklin of Atlanta, Renee Glover, who was the Black um, Housing Authority Executive Director, and then Beverly Hall, who was the first Black woman superintendent of public schools, all sort of act um, and collude to um, further the demolition of public housing as sort of common sense. Um, and you start to see, again, this sort of tension around respectability and representation of Black women images, um, particularly the idea of the single um, mother or the welfare queen uh, versus these sort of um, ideal role models of um, Black women leadership. Uh, here again, sort of casting um, public housing developments as the eyesore um, to facilitate the rise of the Olympic development. Um, here, um, again, like most public housing in Atlanta was a garden style low rise um, was in fairly good condition, but was very old. Um, here we have Techwood Homes um, or Clark Howell, and Clark Howell Homes, uh, again, built in 36 and 1940, um, contrasted against the sort of new high rise. And so um, it was pretty much guaranteed that these buildings would be demolished, um, but how it was sort of packaged to residents was through one of redevelopment and return. Um, instead of um, kind of this later sort of displacement that occurred. Um, the Olympic neighborhoods also kind of lining up carefully with some of the early maps of which sort of um, public housing 
developments to clear out in order to facilitate the expansion of the central business district. And so it kind of maps pretty nicely um, alongside the targeted Olympic neighborhoods for investment and redevelopment. Um, protesting here, um, pretty much all in vain. Uh, here, Ethel May Matthews still sort of fighting uh, for public housing, um, but not able to really go up against the massive machine that came with the Olympics. Um, there are lots of people who study mega events and its role in sort of dominating the local political machine. And so this was sort of the last gasp of um, public housing organizing in the city. Um, and so some of my new work, which I'm happy to talk more about during Q&A, um, is around um, where can we sort of see these um, housing movements and this sort of organizing and mobilizing around working class politics that sort of takes up the core issues of the working poor um, and uses it through the lens of um, housing needs and housing crises. And so I've been working with the Housing Justice League in Atlanta um, and interviewing um, lots of women who were former public housing tenants and understanding how they kind of um, go through their housing search and how this is connected to their ability to access better public goods and services, um, and what are their methods and strategies and tools to mobilize um, as the sort of geography of um, housing precarity has um, sprawled across the region. Um, one of the ways in which they actually do this is through public schools, um, which is another topic that I'm also working on here in Philly. Um, and so understanding the sort of critical link between housing and schools and, and how planning can play a larger role there. Um, so generally, I'm, I'm, I'm also happy to sort of talk about methods, but I try to also think about the complexity of data sources um, and sort of looking at um, housing and other sort of um, outcomes of planning um, within the full context of, of what they serve. They're not just, you know, housing units, it's not just shelter. It is something that is um, much more of a bundle of, of politics, of, um, you know, um, ownership and community, uh, belongingness. And so thinking about the study of these, um, of public housing as being a study of all of these different features um, and the different data required to sort of construct these narratives, particularly over time and space. Um, so I will stop sharing and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. I can see you clapping, but I can't hear you. <laughs> You're muted. Can you hear us? Gotcha. <laughs> Great. Uh, okay. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation and sure. dive into the historical context um, of this work. We, we just in my class had a friend come and talk about how that again reminded us of Engels' uh, quote saying that the bourgeoisie has no solution to the housing question and has to move it around. So it's fascinating to see how the same. Uh, kind of style of architecture in different conditions and different times has such different connotations associated with it. And I think that really goes to show how the politics and the social conditions really matter. And it's not necessarily the architectural design in shaping the social outcomes, although that, that does play a part. But just in the ways that this one type of product changes over time and how it's talked about, it suggests that there is no one right solution um, in that respect. I invite students and faculty, um, whether you're online or in person, to come down or raise a hand uh, and ask questions. While, while that's happening, maybe I'll just uh, um, ask one question and invite you to share a little bit more about the archival data methods that you use mm -hmm. and how you scope the question when you go into these. I mean, we once took a tour of the archives here. And the data is actually enumerated in, in cubic uh, feet. So, like, how many cubic feet is this particular archive? It's like 30 cubic feet. And then there's like 30 different boxes that come out of this material. So, how did you 
think about the skills and find the data and manage all the different stories. How do you select for the, the voices you wanted to highlight? Yeah, so big question. Um, I love the archives. I'm actually taking my students to the city archives on Monday. <laughs> so I um, I was pretty fortunate or maybe it was unfortunate, I don't know. But at the time that I was doing my project, um, because Atlanta had demolished the first public housing development like in the country, <laughs> they kind of had to like atone for this, like, you know, they had to make up for it with historic preservation in another way. And so they kept one building and they made that building like a museum or archive. Um, and so they had all of their boxes kind of first, um, a uh, untrained archivist began just sort of collecting things and then they hired a trained archivist to sort of actually create the archive and create a system. Um, but that was all happening as I was writing. <laughs> um, so I didn't, have finding aids. <laughs> I had like someone with like a really good memory and knowledge of like all of these papers and it was like a, a, a process that was ongoing and so there was like warehouses full of documents that they were just sort of like should we keep this should we not you know so like it was not like a very efficient or intentional process um, but Atlanta is also a city like I said it is very obsessed over its image um, and as a result has like an amazing set of archives across the city. And so they have the Atlanta History Center, they have the city archives, um, all of these archives in um, the different universities, Emory, um, you know, um, the ABC has great archives. The first black library that I mentioned um, donated by Carnegie, um, the African Auburn Avenue Research Library has great archives. So, um, one of the issues with it being kind of an image obsessed city is that a lot of things are not there. <laughs> so um, Atlanta's public housing, for example, was segregated um, at its origins and, and when it was time to sort of integrate, you know, in terms of like um, all of these sort of like 1962 executive orders and, you know, eventual like Civil Rights Act, um, they just like did not do it. And so you see these angle reports that show like the white, public housing developments and the black ones and the white applicants and the black applicants. And then in 1968, they're like all one number. It like all totally disappears. But there's no kind of record in the housing authorities archives that talk about this integration. So I had to kind of like go into other archives and go into like the NAACP and like other sort of legal archives to understand the struggles of desegregation and integration. Um, because there's like these, these sort of issues, these sort of silences, I guess you call them um, within the archive. But in terms of like scope and, and limits, like I wanted to write this whole sweeping public housing history and it was my committee that told me to chill out. <laughs> they were like, why don't you take this dissertation from 36 to 74? That's when Nixon creates this moratorium on, on public housing construction. Um, because no one can do this 70 year dissertation. <laughs> um, and so I kind of wrote the rest of the story after, um, after I finished my dissertation um, and, and took the long years to kind of figure everything out. Um, but certainly I think if I did it again, I would do like an actual case study selection. I kind of just like chose things instead of like choosing things based on data, I chose things to make a good case study. So like this sort of like, this was constructed here and this was constructed at this time and this is in this type of neighborhood. So it was like a very sort of like uh, methodological sort of like approach to choosing the cases. But then one of my cases had like no data whatsoever. So I kind of had to tell this larger story in that chapter. Um, and so that would, there's kind of like no perfect way like you have to write a dissertation in a certain number of years and you don't have like all of this time to do it um but certainly like with the archives um i think you can like always go about it just like with any like research um or data tool or or data source you can always like slice and dice it in different ways um but i that was sort of my approach to scoping the question was choosing a certain number of cases and then having my committee tell me to like cut down the years a bit so yeah you can always like write more when you're done your dissertation or thesis you don't have to write it all at one time 
Hey, here. Thank you so much for this talk. It, I've been trying to trying to hear you speak about this for a little bit and keep missing you. So this is really great. Yeah. Um, and I appreciate all the, the work you're doing. Oh, here, let me put my hand down. Um, so, so I'm curious, I'm doing, I'm writing a dissertation right now on how the places that older lesbians in Los Angeles need change over time. And one thing that's come up a lot has been housing um, and how the, basically like the use of the house um, is mm -hmm. so, is, is kind of transformative and they disrupt all these kind of like heteronormative norms. And anyways, you touched on especially some older women organizing um, in these developments and using the house for different um, kind of healing practices, community development, and especially community development is something that comes up a lot um, in the absence of kind of like public and commercial space for um, historically underserved communities. Um, so I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about that and, and maybe especially with regard to these women who are older and kind of how if that has um if there if there's more there i guess um does that make sense yeah no 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 um it, yes i i think about this also like very randomly like when i watch hgtv and i get like very upset when people like are so specific about the houses that they absolutely need because i'm like why are you not thinking about your future self <laughs> like who cares about i don't know it's like the things that people focus on are very like present and right now and like i need this sort of kitchen i need like open for plants so i can see my kids while they play and it's like they're only going to be doing that for like three years and then like you move on like you don't need all that so like i totally i like both like understand that issue but also like don't really like have that um they didn't really I, I wish they designed public housing with that kind of like in mind um like with the like aging in place what they ended up doing was sort of like warehousing all of the elderly um into like two or three developments and eventually they they build elderly public housing and then that's like the only public housing that's actually kind of left in Atlanta is like a bunch of high rise um, public housing for elderly, for senior citizens. Um, and so I, I think that to me, thinking of how um, these women in particular sort of mobilize is very interesting because they were pretty powerful. And so they mobilize their, a lot around public safety. Um, and this becomes one of the like the main dividers. And so they are the ones sort of like advocating for um, policing. Um, they are the ones who are advocating a lot of the like available public housing funding in the in the 80s and 90s in particular were um, like funding for surveillance and funding for security. And so you could get like bars on the windows, but you can get new windows, right? Or you could get, you know, like numbers painted on the roof, but like you couldn't get a new roof. So like these were like the types of funds that were available and through like increased like private public partnerships. Um, so essentially, I feel like the failure to sort of plan across the sort of like aging spectrum or across the lifetime um, of people in public housing created these sort of like false divisions that um, really start to um, like produce tensions, but produce a lot of like physical and ideological um, um, distance between different public housing residents. And so um, you don't see the like elderly women who are leaders like engaging with the younger women and they sort of like spin off and do their own thing and they're not. So like at the time, for example, of the Atlanta child murders, like there were people like Mary Sanford and others kind of talking about like, well, of course these kids are gone. Like these moms are like on the phone all day. They're not like watching their kids. And so like, there was like a lot of that um and so yeah so this is but i don't know i try to like think about all of this within the context in, in which it's happening um like how you see these um these elderly women like calling women who are their neighbors welfare queens 
um, even though they all live in the same house, you know? So like, they're also getting like some form of like social security or something like that, but they're kind of like, you know, dismissing those or getting a welfare check or something. So um, there's uh, a lot of sort of tension that I feel like could have been addressed by planning across the spectrum. And there's this like, particularly in public housing um, and other like social planning, there's like this desire to push the elderly and children together. You'll see like a lot of elder care, daycare combinations. And those were the sorts of responses that the housing authority would have um, that, you know, the older women really pushed back against. Like, I don't want, <laughs> this is not like what I'm thinking when I talk about recreation or when I talk about my own space. And so, um, yeah, I don't, I don't have an answer to that question, but it's something that I'm like grappling with. And I feel like it relates to thinking about housing, both how you're saying like for these different uses, whether it's like social or like shelter or like global or organizing, but like also like across the lifetime. Awesome, thank you so much. No problem. <laughs> Are there other A really dramatic entrance. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Um, thanks so much for being here. It was a really um, amazing recount. Um, yeah. I was thinking about um, when you talked about uh, police a couple times throughout, um, you first talked about the, the Black police force of the 1940s. And then when you showed the picture of the police officer in like the 90s as a white police officer, I was wondering if like the demographic change, and, and now I know that the Atlantic, uh, Atlanta um, police officer. Uh, department is more uh, majority black now. I wonder if like that demographic change of police changed at all how the public housing and police interacted or um, if so, how? Um, yeah, so I, I wish I had more time to get into the police in the book, but I will say like the most frightening thing that I found in the archives, which was like the benefit of like having archives that weren't fully processed, was this letter from the Black Chief of Police, Beverly Harbor, to um, Renee Glover, the head of the Housing Authority, um, that asked um, essentially if her, um, if the Housing Authority was paying bonuses to the police department to um, raid residents' houses um, so that they would be evicted from public housing um, because of the one strike loss in 96, where if you had any sort of strike, arrest, anyone in your household, um, that you would be eligible for eviction from public housing um, and not eligible to apply anywhere else. Um, and so, um, you know, Chief Harvard sent that letter and um, it goes through kind of the housing authority as people kind of check. And they're like, no, you know, we're not seeing that these bonuses are being paid. So they didn't really like answer the question of whether or not cops were going into homes and like doing this. But this was like also something that was um, being noted in sort of like the records of tenant association meeting minutes, um, that this was like a known sort of way of sort of evicting undesirables as sort of highlighted in the 1970s. Um, and so I don't, um, and so at that point, you know, this was a letter from like 1999, 2000. So at that point, there were certainly more um, Black police officers at the time. And so I don't necessarily think that um, the transformation of the racial makeup of the police department had a huge impact on sort of public housing politics and their decision to work with or against them. Um, I think it was very much that um, policing sort of operates as a way of, you know, enforcing that social control. Um, and it's whether or not, you know, they are in favor of the machine or not. And so very similar to those like divisions within the elderly and sort of younger population, you see um, obviously greater support for policing um, from these sort of elderly leaders and um, decreasing support from the youth who were being targeted by, by the police at the time. So um, it certainly has a pretty, you know, those sort of notes from the 40s about 
um, I showed one about like the concerns about the transformation of um, management from federal to local control, but that was also um, having increased black police officers were something that early public housing residents wanted because they had not been afforded public safety. Um, but these calls really um, start to come from external. Um, the idea, you know, there was a self-imposed curfew in the early 80s um, in the wake of the child murders. And then eventually you see uh, mayoral imposed curfew from Maynard Jackson in 1990s, um, around the time that picture was taken that you're uh, referencing, um, where they ended up arresting like 6,000 um, residents in, in one weekend. Um, and so for violating curfew. And so these are the sorts of like egregious um, sort of things that happened um, with the police over time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for what all of the research that you've been sharing with us. It's really fascinating. I was curious about, um, so you mentioned that uh, the populations that were displaced um, when the neighborhoods that were seen as slums were cleared um, were then kind of um, densely populated in the public housing where there was a population of people who did not have access to economic upward mobility. And I'm curious um, if you know what, what was seen after those same areas were then cleared for the Olympic development, um, whether you saw those populations of people who were displaced um, moving to another kind of densely um, uh, area where, where um, they were pulled back together, or if you know if those populations were more dispersed mm -hmm. within the city, and what happened to the, um, those people who were displaced? Lots of things, great question. Um, so um, Deirdre Oakley and um, some others have done a lot of research on um, sort of the this displacement that occurred around um, Olympic redevelopment, hope six. Um, but there are a few things. So one, um, many were sort of moved to other public housing developments. So this was pretty common, even with the women that I talked to who kind of grew up in public housing, um, they grew up in like the 90s. And so they talk about moving from one development to another as they were being redeveloped. Um, so that was usually the first thing that happened. The second thing that usually happened was that you were given a voucher um, and voucher holders tend to recluster, maybe not like the same redevelopments or the same developments clustering, but they tend to cluster because they're, they are also disproportionately accepted in kind of like low income areas um, or areas that lacking um, economic opportunity. Um, so that was sort of one thing. And then there were some who were able to return. But the um, issue I think with a lot of public housing redevelopment is one of time. Um, some of these places, they would start their demolition in like 1996 and it wouldn't be until like 2010, you start to see redevelopment and like opening in 2015. And so like issues like not being able to um, cobble enough federal funding together. Sometimes the federal government would reject applications after they started demolition and um, relocation. Um, and then you kind of have, of course, like the foreclosure crisis in 2008 that like puts a halt to like all construction. Um, and so these sort of things like honestly would be like a couple of years and people are like, well, I'm not going to move back because my kids are in school. I'm like, I have a job here. Like I'm like settled here. Um, a lot of people did not want to come back because of the condition of the housing before was so inferior that it generated a lot of like trauma um, associated to the actual space and site. Um, so you definitely hear people who were eligible to return that didn't want to. Um, but usually the displacements, um, uh, Deirdre Oakley um, talks about this as a churning that happens. Um, there's typically this sort of like, particularly of like suburban uh, leaders that, you know, like all of the poor, once you knock down public housing, everyone like moved to the suburbs and the suburbs became poor. Um, and that's not really the case. They kind of like churn through these different areas 
of housing and stability, um, very much in the way that's documented, um, documented in uh, Desmond's Evicted, right? Like this idea that your housing is like permanently unstable um, once you kind of leave public housing. Um, so they're not like going to the suburbs, although there are a few who are in suburban areas. Um, they're largely just going to areas of worse housing quality throughout the city, um, occasionally losing their vouchers um, because they're unable to find anyone to accept it. And once it's lost, it's pretty much gone from that household forever. And so the, the housing precarity only increases over time, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the talk and for all the work that you're doing uncovering these histories, right? Thank and you. I've, you know, and I've been told that I should look at the mic, but I'm so inclined to look up at you, which, which is, <laughs> anyway, so it kind of looks like, you know, I'm in some sort of, anyway, oh my God. <laughs> it's kind of hilarious. But so here's my question. I want to go back to this, you know, to, to where Linda started, where she talked about method and the archives, right? But I want to go back to the researcher. So, so you or whoever else is doing research. Now we live in very identity politics charged times, right? And, and I mean, always, but I think now even more so. And so this question of who has the right to tell whose stories mm -hmm. and who can enter into which spaces is something particularly when it comes to uncovering histories like you're doing, um, is, is a really, it's a charged question. And so I'm very curious to sort of hear I think your experiences as a researcher in the field, what it means to be who you are doing the work you're doing. And there is also, I think, the emotional labor of doing such work, um, which for many of us who work in the regions that we are from, um, poses both very difficult challenges, but also brings with it a kind of insight that mm -hmm an outsider can really break. So there's, there's, you know, so there is, I think, the question of uh, what always fascinates me in the building of knowledge, the question of, of lived experience, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it's yeah. very charged, especially in this moment. So I'd love to hear your comments and thoughts on it. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, that's a great question. And I actually did not write a positionality statement for this work, um, although I force all of my students to write one for all of their pieces, um, because I do think that it's very important. Um, I did not um, ever live in public housing. Um, I'm not from Atlanta. Um, and so I'm definitely an outsider as it relates to that. Um, I did have an interest, um, I didn't really set out to tell a story about Black women, but it ended up being about Black women as a result of me kind of looking at these politics over time and at tenant associations in particular that were traditionally kind of led and occupied by Black women. Um, and even that, you know, like even something like the title of my book, like um, Diverging Space for Deviants, like one of the um, older women that I interviewed, um, and I didn't really like use a lot of interviews for the book because by the time I was writing the book, it had been at least 20 years since public housing had really kind of been starting its demolitions and were demolished. And I didn't really want to like use interview data that that, that old um, essentially. Um, and so I, I definitely don't, think that, um, you know, everyone, particularly those who lived in public housing, would like see the title of Deviant and think that it was like, or understand like the reason I chose it. I chose it to be sort of critical of the idea that one could be politically deviant and like not really participating. Um, and instead looking at how deviants do participate, those who are like marginalized and excluded from systems do actually have robust political participation and are able to reshape their spaces and surroundings. Um, but it doesn't always translate essentially. And so I think um, kind of, I certainly, did appreciate my own positionality and being able to see this sort of duality and even like more than a duality of like black women leadership, um, looking at kind of the original um, public housing developments and the role of black women um, who were not leaders in early tenant associations. They were virtually all led by men 
except when there's like a secretary position, there'd be a woman. Um, most, you know, public housing households in the beginning were um, married couples um, living together. And so there was usually a male leadership structure before public housing populations changed. Um, and so I do think that um, my lived experience and my positionality allowed me to think about the complexity of Black womanhood and sort of like the representation of Black women over time um, through the sort of politics of public housing. Um, thinking also about um, like the emotional labor for sure. Um, it was very sort of like, it was a lot to sort of go through this. I like never, there's like never a high note really for me and my work, like there's no upset. Like they tore down this housing, these people were displaced, they're in worse quality housing, right? Um, here are some happy stories, like some people got nice homes and that worked out for them and there wasn't a lot of trauma in the move or relocation or anything like that, but the vast majority did not. Um, and there's lots of like health problems that came out of um, a lot of these public housing developments. A lot of the siting were on kind of like toxic lands or sited adjacent to industrial lands. And so you have all of the issues um, of environmental justice and, and public health issues there. Um, and so that was, that was a lot to sort of read and process all of that in the archive. Um, but I do think it's, um, while I think the ability to be an insider is good, it's also, I think, good to be an outsider. Um, like I said, Atlanta is a place that's very image conscious, um, particularly as being sort of like a black Mecca. And it's only recently you start to see people critique this um, issue of it being a black Mecca without it being seen as some like radical revelation. Um, it's becoming a bit more common sense, um, but it's it's um, something that is not necessarily like taken up all of the time. So I do think in being sort of critical of the city, um, it's helpful for some, but it's also makes it easy to dismiss by others because I am an outsider. Um, so I don't really have like an, a way of sort of guarding for that or protecting against that like sort of embrace or criticism. Um, but I do think um, having that insider outsider perspective is helpful. And I think it's like obviously not something everyone can embody. Um, I was just lucky to have chosen Atlanta and not live there. I would have easily done this story in Philadelphia if I had the ability to. Um, but I do think, you know, that is also the benefit of having like really robust peer review and like going through lots of different conferences and presentations. So like I presented this to like Atlanta studies for several years. I presented geographers, political scientists, planners, um, urban affairs, urbanists, all of that. And so getting all of those different perspectives, I think also helped me um, process a lot of this information and, and think about both the, the lived experience that I was able to bring, but also like how others would perceive my, my findings. And so, um, yeah, something I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm lucky to have that time with this book and that I didn't have to rush it um, to sort of get all of the feedback that I did and all the perspectives that I did. Um, but yeah, if I could do it again, I, I would have done some things differently for sure around like the framings of these dynamics. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for the question. Hi, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, my name is Trevor <laughs> Smith, and I'm a first year MRP student here as well. Sorry, I want to look at your face. So. <laughs> it's okay. I, I'm like freaked out by how big my face must be on the screen, the way you guys are looking. Like, Jesus. <laughs> I have a two part question here. You know, this week we have just read a reading in English class in regards to like, um, military urbanism and so essentially it's like talking about how a lot of the local police precincts have been able to get military equipment and everything passed down by like because of different bills that are passed by congress and everything and also because of everything that's taking place last year and so i'm just interested to see like i noticed in the pictures that um community policing is also taking place in those images as well so mm -hmm. I'm curious to know, like, what are your thoughts on 
um, public house again policing is in like regards to like how it's being done because I'm noticing that like funds are being increased over time even though what took place last year police fundings are still being increased in public housing and also in other different sectors as well and then my, the second part of my question is um, what I'm also interested in black feminism as well and I noticed that through your readings and your writings and everything so I'm just curious to know what are the um, black feminist scholarships that you reference and cite it from Sure, thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, so public housing and policing, um, I think public housing has always relied on surveillance and who surveils has changed over time. Um, so like in the beginning, it was like housing managers through their like extensive staff, you know, so they would be like, you can't hang anything from your balcony, which is something that still exists in a lot of public housing developments. Um, you can't, you know, you need to make sure that your house is clean. We're going to inspect that, which is something they still do. So like in elderly public housing, they'll literally like come into your apartment once a year. And if there's like clothes on the floor, they'll write you up. Um, and so I, I was speaking with one of the like current leaders of one of those elderly developments and she was like yeah I eventually had them do like free laundry because like the reason like people's houses were unclean is because they didn't have any money to do like quarterly laundry and things like that. Um, and so like these are some of the issues I think um, as it relates to surveillance and in particular that like public housing relies on surveillance. Um, and so the role of the police has certainly changed over time, I think, as um, the housing authority has become more austere and lost more of its either like residents, so there's like more vacant units and it's more like it's easier to like kind of have outsiders come in or to have like people sort of taking over those vacant units. Um, and as like their own staffs and everything got cut and there was less time to do inspections and to have housing managers check on people and they start to rely on things like the police. And so you start to see, like I said, police come in and um, there was like allegations of misuse of the master key um, or even giving police officers a master key to public housing development so that they could enter premises without permission. Um, I think this is certainly like a direct link to um, budget cuts um, of operations and staff in public housing. Um, so yeah, I think like a different question would be like public housing and surveillance. And I would say that it absolutely hinges and requires surveillance for public housing policy in this country. Um, you also see this in like project-based Section 8, Section 8 vouchers. They all kind of rely on like the surveillance of whether or not you're following the rules and whether or not you're like, you know, did you report that you had a second kid? Did you report change in income? You know, all of that. But like if a landlord of those properties like messes up or does anything like that, there's like very little accountability. So that I think is like also something that it's not so much about the supply or supplier of the housing subsidy, but also more about um, the user, the demander of the housing subsidy that's being surveilled. Um, oh, for the second part of the question, um, Black feminist scholars. Yeah. Um, wow. Okay. Um, I sort of like did like a reading list <laughs> of Black feminist scholars um, after I graduated. So that's what I'm saying. Like I didn't start off writing about Black women um, or Black feminism. Um, I just decided because so much of my dissertation revolved around Black women leadership, that it felt appropriate to engage in Black feminism as a way of understanding um, why some of these choices were being made. So I looked at um, largely like Black women political scientists, um, like Julia Jordan Zachary and Kathy Cohen and Nadia um, Brown out of Georgetown, um, who look at both like marginalized Black women, um, like Kathy Cohen, um, you know, famously looked at um, lesbians and organizing um, around like AIDS activism in the 90s, um, but also like Nadia Brown writes about like the rise of the Black women mayor and Black women in like electoral politics and state houses. She has a book called Sisters in the State House. And then there's women like Duchess Harris, who writes about Black feminist politics from Kennedy to Obama. Um, but also looking at um, women who write about Black feminist study um, as a method, as sort of like 
through cultural study. So um, there's a fantastic scholar um, at University of Minnesota, um, Terion Williamson, who wrote um, this brilliant book about um, kind of like the method of understanding how sort of like black women um, like live and um, build kind of like their space and home life. So also looking at like home places by Bell Hooks. Um, there's another scholar, Zinzele Isake, um, who's at Rutgers, I think, who wrote about um, black women in Newark um, and sort of their reclamation of space. Um, so yeah, if you reach out, I can send you like my reading list, but those are some of the women that I sort of engage with um, to kind of understand what was happening in tenant associations. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hello. Hi. Very weird to speak this way. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for your talk. Um, thinking about public housing in the present day, um, can you speak more about the Atlantic Council of PTAs and other informal networks you found that provide effective opportunities for assembly and mobilization? Yeah, um, so as noted, they're really the only kind of remaining public housing in Atlanta is elderly public housing, there's really no, and there's like project based section eight and things like that. And so the sort of geographies of working class politics has been quite fractured because of this housing precarity um, induced and kind of exacerbated by the foreclosure crisis and then now kind of the eviction crisis. Um, and so, uh, like I said, there are places like Housing Justice League that organize and help, um, you know, residents organize tenants and, you know, um, create these sort of tenant associations very informally in different buildings, whether they're, you know, market rate, subsidized, any, you know, a mix um, as a result. Um, but many women kind of like live alone, right? They live either in single family homes or they live in apartment buildings and they're very disconnected from others who have similar struggles. So the tenant association was effective because you have people in these um, areas um, that are concentrated um, with similar types of problems, right? So they're positioned similarly, like politically, socially, economically, socially. Um, and so that is not always happening uh, where these women are living or these men are living um, post public housing. Um, and so in talking with um, members of the Housing Justice League, they said that they like found out about the Housing Justice League through the PTA cluster and that the PTA clusters, which are clusters of PTAs, um, kind of like a spatial uh, clustering, um, you know, informed by the school district. So this is like another sort of layer. Um, that is where they kind of found that they had similar problems around like, oh, my heat isn't on. Oh, my water isn't working. Oh, this is the number you need to call for this. This is who you should call for that. Oh, I need some place to live. I know someone who can help you. Um, and so like these sort of like common issues that are centered around a shared community um, here like different school catchments for like kind of a new space. So eventually the regional PTAs actually start to provide some of the services that tenant associations were doing. So like bringing in legal aid, bringing in the Housing Justice League, like bringing in these external social services um, because all these, you know, largely mothers of young school age children um, were having these sort of common issues. And this was like a place to centralize um, some solution making and some organizing. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're uh, about at time, but I want to have you end us on a positive note because so much of what you've shared is really a painful history. And I sure. wanted you to speak um, maybe just for a couple minutes about the work that you're doing around Green New Deals for schools and what, what that vision is and what the implementation is and how people who are planners might work on these kinds of um, really positive forward moving actions that are good. Yeah, um, so I was um, one of many authors of sort of a research brief for the Green New Deal for Public Schools, which was introduced as legislation by Representative Jamal Bowman of New York's 16th District. 
um, on in July of 2021. Um, the Green New Deal for Schools is a way of addressing um, a lot of the core issues that are happening um, in schools and thus in local communities. Um, the report sort of positions um, schools as vital community infrastructure and thus needs to be um, funded and maintained by the federal government as if it is actual infrastructure. So um, currently um, the federal government provides 0% of any school facilities budget and only 5% of a school district's operating budget. Um, and so there's very little funding and we have an increasing issue, particularly in cities like Philadelphia, but also like Baltimore, LA, Chicago, New York, um, and rural areas, tribal areas of this issue of um, aging school infrastructure. So in Philadelphia, for example, um, we have 215 school buildings with 11 million square feet of asbestos and are full of like lead and the paint and the water, um, mold, um, Berman. And so we think of the Green New Deal for Schools as infusing federal funds to address some of the inequities that come out of um, school funding um, and the sort of like inequitable system of school funding, which is largely tied to property taxes. Um, and so in my opinion, I think planners should be very much involved in thinking about schools because they're so intimately related to housing and, and housing stability in particular. Um, much of our housing choice is structured around school quality. And so if we have kind of like great, fantastic, healthy schools all over that are equitably distributed and funded, we could also see um, kind of decreasing inequity in our neighborhoods, communities, and cities. Um, so breaking down that urban-suburban divide, the urban-rural divide by equitably funding um, school districts, school construction, um, thinking about it as an issue around educational justice, environmental justice, health justice, and economic justice by retrofitting um, all 100,000 of our K-12 schools in the U.S. Um, and infusing them as really sort of like central conduits in the community. So very much how I was discussing about PTAs as being kind of like critical sites of intervening and providing social goods, thinking about schools within the last year with COVID as being sites of distribution for Chromebooks and food, um, and other goods and services, vaccines, testing. Um, we can think about using schools in a more multi-purpose way that can serve the broader community and thus be invested and supported like other public goods, like parks. You wouldn't close a park. Why would you close a school? That's my high note. <laughs> Thank you so much. Please join me. In. Thank you.